Welcome back to the autumn of 1948, a season of secrets and surprises. Take sex. When Kinsey got people to tell him their sexual secrets, the truth surprised everybody. Take television. If the fact of it weren't surprise enough, the future of it would be. Take promises. Like secrets, they just didn't seem to be kept these days. After World War II, all Germany was divided into four parts, governed by the four conquering powers, Britain, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union. Deep inside the Soviet zone, Berlin, the capital, also was divided into four parts, with the Western Allies guaranteed access to Berlin through the Soviet zone. But by 1948, the Soviets are disturbed about the plans of the Western powers to revitalize Germany, especially by establishing a new common currency in the Allied zones. So the Soviets begin squeezing off access points and roads and railways into Berlin. And one day in June, with a Berliners be damned attitude, the Soviets seal off the western sections of the city entirely. Overnight, without warning, Germans in the three western sectors of Berlin are cut off from the outside world. No power, no food, no one allowed in or out. One hundred and eighty-five square miles, most of it still rubble from Allied bombs, is totally surrounded by Soviet troops. Only the air is open. So President Truman sends in supplies by plane to maintain the Allied foothold in Berlin. It's called the Berlin Airlift. Stuart Symington was Secretary of the Air Force. I think we felt we had as much right to be in Berlin as, as the Russians did, even though we let them go in first. And if we'd given up Berlin, I think it's fair to say that we felt we would be giving up Germany. And that could have been disastrous to the future. The British are also part of the airlift. One of their pilots, Freddie Laker. We found ourselves with a new enemy that was indeed m much more formidable than Germany itself. It's a rescue effort of unprecedented magnitude. Hundreds of planes flying round the clock, trying to feed and clothe two and a half million people, trying literally to save their lives. For Lieutenant Gail Halverson, it's a mission worthy of the Good Samaritan. To provide the sustenance for life in a city that was besieged, cut off, tried to, to starve them in a submission, we felt we had a purpose. And, and we, we didn't, didn't complain about flying all night or all day. Whatever hate I had for the Germans because of the war, I can assure you it disappeared in a few days after going onto the airlift. For pilot Jack Bennett, the night shift is extra tough. Suddenly there was a flash of light in our eyes, Copal and I, like the sun going down. Well, the sun was behind us. We couldn't figure out what was wrong. And the Russians mounted an enormously powerful searchlight over here in the East Berlin and tried to blind us. But occasionally there were, um, the MiGs would buzz the airplanes and that was all rather frightening. And they'd come alongside and waggle in their wings but no one took any notice. No one was going to follow them, for example. Still, the airlift continues. By September, more than 4,000 tons of supplies are coming in every day. Planes are landing three minutes apart. If the airlift brings food to the city, it also brings nightmares to some of the city's children. Mercedes Wild is eight years old. She lives in Berlin. Our nerves had been shattered by bombing raids as children. This was a new strain. We children in the flight path couldn't sleep well because the airplanes flew down pretty low. And the child is small, the house is tall, and the airplane is right over it. It makes a strong impression. 
One day, during his layover in Berlin, Lieutenant Halverson gives away two sticks of gum he happens to have on him. And you couldn't believe the look on the kid's face. They got a half a stick of gum, just like they got a million bucks. And they unwrapped the wrapper very carefully, and the other kids wanted the wrapper. They passed the wrapper around for their kids to smell. I couldn't believe it. So I told the kids, if you'll come back here tomorrow, stand in that open place, right in front of the runway, I'll drop enough gum and candy, but you'll all have some if you'll share it. Just a little love will go a long way. Ooh, yeah. And you make me happy the rest of my day. Put your arms around. Before long, drops are being made every day, and this American lieutenant now has a nickname. He is the candy bomber. Ich bekam keinen Fallschirm. I didn't get a parachute, so I wrote a letter saying, Dear Chocolate Uncle, please drop me a candy parachute. I'm sure you'll recognize this house. It's the one with the white chickens in the garden. Best wishes, your Mercedes. So I started looking for white chickens, and I couldn't find them. I told my buddies, hey, look for the white chickens we've got to drop to me. Nobody could find it. Later, I got a letter from my chocolate uncle. He wrote that he tried to find the garden with the chickens, but he couldn't, so he enclosed some candy and chewing gum. For me as a child, this was a big surprise. The airlift is expected to be over in a few weeks, but the Soviets refuse to lift the blockade, even into October when the United Nations asks them to. A compromise proposal for settling the Berlin blockade received the familiar treatment, this time from the Soviet Deputy Foreign Minister, Andrei Vyshinsky. And the Berlin crisis continues. The Soviets veto, but they never attack. Because they knew we had the bomb and they didn't have it. The line is drawn. There are ever so many who will say the actions of the Soviet Union came as no surprise to them and should in fact have been foreseen. Come back to the fall of 48, and a surprise that few are bold enough to claim they foresaw. Come back to Our World and Secrets and Surprises in the fall of 48. Welcome back to the autumn of 1948. There's a presidential campaign going on, but nobody takes it very seriously, because everybody already knows who's going to win. The next president, can you see all right, Howdy? Boy. Of the kids of the United States is Howdy Doody. Hey, we're in Howdy Doody. November 2nd, Election Day, 1948. Every child in the country whose family has a TV set knows Howdy Doody has been elected president of all the kids of America. No big surprise here. If Howdy Doody had won the real election, he wouldn't have been much more surprising than the man who did. The Chicago Tribune didn't seem to believe it, even after it happened. But Harry Truman did win. Despite a couple of renegade candidates from his own party, who siphoned off about a million votes apiece from his total, and despite the fact that he was considered an accidental president, who was in office only because he was vice president when Franklin Roosevelt died. A nice man, Truman, but in over his head, they say. Truman's campaign strategist and advisor is Clark Clifford. Roosevelt's had, reputation had been so enormous. He brought the country through its worst depression in history. He brought them through the greatest war in history. And then all of a sudden came this modest, rather plain speaking, simple fellow from Midwestern United States, from Missouri. The people didn't take to him very much. Everybody's doing the doghouse boogie now. The people, they say, are angry because Truman hasn't prevented prices from rising after the war. But what can you expect from a failed businessman, a small-time politician who isn't and never will be FDR? Truman doesn't make jokes, he is one. To err is Truman. There are, however, some people with true liberal convictions who worry over the state of the world, whose worry over the state of the world 